Hi, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started now with our Engaging Spanish-Speaking Families webinar. So first of all, thank you so much for joining us. Um, we're really pleased um, that you're all here to hear more about what Babies First Test has been doing in this space, um, and we're excited to share more about how we've been engaging Spanish-speaking families. So just a few housekeeping items before we launch into it. Um, this webinar is being recorded, and a link will be available online on the Babies First Test YouTube channel within 48 hours, and will also be uploaded to our resource center. You can use the chat box on the side of um, your screen to submit questions at any time during the presentation, but we will hold until the end to address those. We have a designated Q&R uh, portion at the end of the webinar, um, and we'll be sure to answer your questions at that time. Additionally, um, if you're having any trouble with audio, make sure that you enter your audio pin, which is located in the audio section of the control panel. Finally, if you need any IT or technical assistance during the webinar, you can use the chat box to communicate to the presenters and we'll do our best to help you out. So the agenda, um, we're gonna first start with a brief overview of Baby's First Test and what we do. We'll follow that with um, a presentation from Luisa Soterna Castaneda about engaging Latino families in public health. And then we will switch back to Baby's First Test to talk about engaging Spanish-speaking families in newborn screening. And finally, we'll round it off with a Q&A portion. And I just realized I didn't introduce myself at the top. Um, my name is Amelia Mulford, and I am a program coordinator for Baby's First Test. So who are we at Baby's First Test? So to start, um, we are the Newborn Screening Clearinghouse. We are a one-stop shop for newborn screening information and education. We are created based on the Newborn Screening Safe Lives Act in 2008, which was reauthorized in 2014. And our goal is to increase newborn screening awareness, training, and education through engagement. And we really emphasize engagement as a key piece of what we do. Babies First Test houses the nation's newborn screening clearinghouse. As a clearinghouse, Babies First Test informs, supports, Forms and supports millions of families and healthcare professionals throughout the newborn screening experience. So, um, with Baby's First Test, we offer many ways to learn, connect, and share um, newborn screening information. So, while we do have other programs such as the Consumer Task Force and Challenge Awards, babiesfirsttest.org is our primary platform for increasing knowledge, awareness, and engagement. And we do this in a variety of ways. So we do offer information on newborn screening at multiple levels, so national, state, and local. We have information about what to expect from newborn screening and the newborn screening process. We collect and share family experiences on our website, so families who have um, gone through newborn screening and want to tell um, other people about what that experience was like for them. We offer details on state programs, including what they screen for, contacts, policy, and procedures. We have information on all 78 newborn screening conditions. We have a number of educational resources um, that are available for download or order from our resource center, which I will touch on a little bit later. We have our interactive national map. We host public squares um, where people from around the country can engage in informative um, discussions about various newborn screening topics. And we're also very active on social media. So just to give you a little more information on the site, since 2011, we have had over 2.5 million visitors and 5 million hits. However, in 2015, we wanted to have a better understanding of who was coming to our site and if they were finding what they were looking for. So we conducted a user survey that ran from the end of 2015 to early 2016. And what we found is up on that pie chart there, um, it's a pretty even split between parents and health professionals. Um, as well as 7% uh, slice of advocates. We also found through the user survey, 65% reported that they learned something they didn't know before. 85% reported they were able to find the information they were seeking and agreed that the information on our site was easy to find. And 90% um, of people said that their questions were answered by visiting the website. Analytics also told us that more than 50% of our traffic comes from mobile devices. So while our website is already optimized um, for mobile devices and is mobile friendly, 
we wanted to provide health professionals and other frequent users of the site the ability to find newborn screening information at the touch of their fingers and offline if needed. So in 2015 and 2016, we created the free mobile app, which is available on both um, the iOS and um, Android platforms. And so this gives people the ability to search state information and condition information, and you can save your searches um, so that they are accessible offline, as I mentioned. And it is free. So if you're interested, definitely check that out. Um, and so that was kind of a drive-by overview of our web platform, but we are much more than a website. So I mentioned earlier that we do have our consumer task force and challenge award programs that really kind of get us in touch with um, communities at the local level. We also want to make sure that you all know that we're able to review your educational materials um, if you have newborn screening content that you'd like us to take a look at. We can also create and co-brand educational materials with you. If you see something on our resource center, for example, that you would like to co-brand, we're always open to those kind of opportunities. And finally, if you need help with your educational efforts, for example, how to reach different audiences or how to tailor or target your content, or if you need advice, we can offer technical assistance for that as well. Um, if you'd like to know more about this, you can reach out to Jackie Seisman, who's our assistant director, and her email address is up there on the screen. And with that, um, I would like, actually before we move into the next section, um, I just want to kind of take a temperature reading and, and learn a little bit more about who's on the line right now and who you all are. So we're gonna launch a poll um, that will just help us learn a little bit more about our audience today. Um, we'll just give you guys a couple seconds or a minute to um, fill that out. Okay, great. So, looks like uh, about two thirds are state employees. Um, and we, actually, I realized this was uh, multiple choice allowed, so some people might have clicked multiple roles, which is great. So, um, a lot of state employees and public health professionals, and some health professionals and some advocates. So, really nice distribution there. That's great. All right, and with that, now we're going to move into the next section of the presentation. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Luisa Soterna Castaneda. She is an engagement consultant who has been working with Babies First Test um, for several years now, really um, lending her expertise to our work in Spanish engagement. Um, and with that, I will turn it over to Luisa. Buenos dias, good morning, and thank you, Amelia. I hope everyone is having a lovely Monday morning. And I hope that you're joining me from your office um, suite or your home office with a cup of coffee or tea at hand. So as Amelia mentioned, my name is Luisa Saturna Castaneda. I've been working with um, in the public health realm for quite a few years. And um, I am just interested to have a conversation with you and probably share with you a little bit of my history um, and the information that I think is particularly important for you to be aware of. Some of you um, may be well connected with um, the Hispanic community. Some of you may be uh, just looking at to, you know, opportunities of engagement and effort. Um, so we'll start with the big why. Each of you probably have has a reason why, but we're gonna um, do a little quick poll. Um, and Amelia, can you guys uh, run that poll on your end? Yep, we're on it. All right. And I'm assuming the poll's loading. Sorry, I'm not sure that I see it on my end. Yep, we'll 
pull the results up now. Do you see that, Louisa? Wonderful. Um, no, but let me just, sorry, folks, I'm gonna get out of here real quick and go to the poll so I can see it. Um, no, I can't see the results, but can you tell us, Amelia, what you're seeing on your end? Yes, so we're seeing 96% um, <laughs> said true and 4% said false. Got it. Well, so the um, the morning surprise goes to the 4%. So in reality, um, and this is a fascinating um, piece of data that just came out, out of the Pew Research Center. This is where you should go to look up demographic data on Hispanics. Um, they have a wonderful resource, and I highly recommend that you check out the website. But the Pew Research Center has shown that in the last year, more specifically, the growth of the Hispanic population has declined. We're still a very large um, minority group in comparison, or population group in comparison with um, blacks and whites. However, our numbers have dropped in, as you can see from the table on the left-hand side, in 2010, they started to drop. So there are a number of things that are attributed to that, like um, one of the biggest things, of course, is um, immigration. Uh, in 2010, we had a different um, president at the White House. However, there were still a lot of deportations and there were still a lot of things already happening during that presidency. Um, and of course, as you have seen, maybe heard or may not be aware, the numbers have continued to rise. So the number of immigrant communities who are coming into the country have decreased. Also, the um, Pew attributes the lack in this or the the lack, the lack of growth in this um, last year really to um, fertility rates going down within the country. So um, right now we're about 58.6 million individuals in the country who describe ourselves as either Hispanic or Latino. Um, the growth in the population um, really has been the largest for the Hispanic, meaning that um, we account for more than half uh, of individuals who, grow, you know, who have either been born or have moved to the United States within the last year. And so you could see that's on the right-hand side of your screen, that's 51% of our community um, numbers around the country. Another thing that I wanted to show you here, and at the very top, I put um, the link to pewhispanic.org forward slash states. And in that site, what you can do is get a really great demographic breakdown of what the Hispanic Latino community looks like in your state. One of the things that I wanted to highlight, which is very um, interesting to note, is that over the last 20 or so years, the numbers have really shifted in terms of where communities have gone. So we look at 1980s, 1990s, when there were different flows of immigrant communities that were coming into the country. They mostly went to the Northeast Corridor um, or cities in the West, um, where there was already a big establishment of immigrant communities. In the last five, 10 years, we've actually have seen those numbers shift and they've actually immigrated with a greater intensity to the Southern states, predominantly when we're looking at the states like South Carolina, North Carolina, Georgia, some other states, Arkansas, Mississippi, have really seen the Hispanic community grow. And as you, you can see that in the very last um, column on the right-hand side of your screen, where you see that there's an 80% growth over the last five years when this data was collected from 20, 2000 to 2015, or the last 15 years, excuse me. So that's very evident. That's probably where many of you reside. You reside in communities that had not really had a huge influx of um, immigrants or Latinos coming in. However, what happens in communities like this and what I have seen happens is that typically the immigrant communities tend to immigrate to the same communities that are already in dire circumstances, right? So there are communities that have um, low uh, access to schooling, or if there are schools in place that are not the best situated, that there's poor housing, that there's poor infrastructure, that there are a lot of things in place that sort of help them deal with greater challenges than perhaps if they live in communities that are a little bit more established or are used to um, having immigrant communities. So this is something that is important keep in mind, and again, I um, invite you to visit the Pew Institute um, to sort of have an understanding of a little bit more of the state demographics and the information that's been collected from your community. 
In the next slide, um, we have a, a little bit of information here. I put the link to this video here. It's, um, it's a great video that's a my young lady who's a, a blogger. But one of the cool things about the video that I think highlights relatively well is the fact that there are two terms that are commonly used within um, anything that pertains to Latinos slash Hispanics. So Latino typically or Latina typically represents um, a term or an individual who comes from a country in Latin America. And that doesn't necessarily mean that they speak Spanish. Um, so it, it includes countries like French Guiana, it includes countries like Haiti, um, or even um, Brazil. Um, they speak Portuguese, but they don't speak Spanish. So it's more of a Latino is more of a geographic term. So you would not include within that individuals who are Spaniards, meaning that they come from Spain. Those individuals are more of a around, grouped around a language term, meaning that they are individuals whose language is Spanish. So that's why you include Spain in the term Hispanic. And so the term Hispanic was really developed, and I'll show you that to you in another slide, um, was really developed in the language, in our English language system as part of uh, a 1970 census by government officials who were searching for generic term. And I always, when I talk about this term, it's really interesting because it's always something that's also, I think used more or had been traditionally used more in the East Coast. Um, whereas more folks who were in the West Coast would refer and use the term Latino. There's another um, term that's now coming up and about that's called Latinx, which is the word, it's spelled L-A-T-I-N-X. And what that means, and you'll see that also coming up, and I didn't put it in here, um, but what it means is that it's in gender neutral, so that it's anyone of Latin American descent, but it's gender neutral, um, so that you're not sort of leaving anyone out. And so there, there's a great deal of controversy in terms of these two terms and how they're used, but I think it's important for you, if you're not familiar with the term, to understand these two differences in, um, figure out you know, where would be most appropriate and what your communities would benefit the most from. So I'm going to now talk a little bit about opportunities and stories. And with that, I do want to say that you know, every community is different. So very much like the community that you are each residing in, it's very different from your structures and the things that are acceptable and do your communities. So the Latino community is the same way. The Latino communities, you know, the experience of a New Yorkian, meaning uh, someone who is of Puerto Rican descent who resides in the city or was raised in the city of New York and born in the city and or born in the city of New York, it's completely different than a Puerto Rican who is literally living in the island. Um, and the same thing as a Mexican American who may be, you know, recently arrived to the United States under a um, program who's going to school and getting his PhD versus someone who is a fourth generation Mexican American who lives in Arizona and really does not speak Spanish, but feels very much connected to the Hispanic Latino connections and culture. So let's keep that in mind. And then let's talk into the opportunities and stories. So as I mentioned earlier, there are quite a few things that we um, have in our communities in, um, talking here as part of the Latino communities are facing. I'm gonna show you in the next slide. Um, and then I wanna really focus on the challenges here. Why don't you think more on a strength-based approach? To me, that's the key. So on the right-hand side, on the left-hand side, excuse me, what I did is I pulled several headlines from Reese's um, very notable newspaper sources, et cetera, about things that have happened to individuals of immigrants in the Latino community over the last year, year and a half. Individuals who've either gone to court for addressing something that's of personal nature or going to a hospital and they have faced dire circumstances. And so there's a lot of this currently happen with happening in the community. A lot of this is what we hear when we turn on our TVs, listen to our Spanish speaking outlets in media, um, look and turn into our Facebook slash other social media outlets. This is what we're hearing as a community. 
And I, at the very bottom, I want you to really think about the last headline, which is, are you a U.S. citizen? How 2020 census question could affect states. This is something that's going to come down the queue for all of us in communities around the country. And it's going to be a huge wedge um, for our community. So I want you to think about sort of the backdrop and think that that's going to be an opportunity for you and your organization to grow and, and, and change as you think about engaging and think about supporting the communities in, uh, that are Latino or of Latino descent in your actual um, networks. I want you to really focus on what's on the right, which is you have to be sincere, you have to be innovative, and you really have to be ready to empower the community and to engage them. And when I say this is that it doesn't you know, you may be um, facing tons of uh, challenges and you may be facing tons of um, things that affect you as an individual nurse organization trying to support mothers and families and women in general. But by, you know, thinking outside the box, you can really leverage a lot of things. So before we move forward, there's another poll. Um, and if I could ask our... Um, organizers to help me launch the poll. Um, that would be lovely. And this one would be the one about the barriers, if it's possible. All right, we're launching it now. Thank you. And again, my apologies if I can't see. The poll on my end. Louisa, we'll let you know when we close the poll. Um, we'll get people. Great. More All right. All right, we've closed the poll and we're looking at the results now. Sending those over okay. to you. So we're saying the culture awareness, 24% of individuals say that that's a barrier for them. Language, lang access to language resources, 52%. Institutional barriers, mm -hmm, 12%. External, internal, 8%, and other. Um, Four. And I'm sorry, are those those are not percentages, those are counts, correct? Those are the percentages. Oh, okay, perfect. So four percent. Excellent. So um so this is very helpful to um to, to get a little bit of the conversation that we'll have next. So what I'm gonna show you, um share with you is two case um examples. So here's an initiative called Text for Baby, which Text for Baby is a um an initiative that provides information to moms um, in both English and Spanish via text messages. Um, it originally started with simple text messages. The idea was to connect moms to information and resources, and then to remind them of doctor's appointments, immunizations, et cetera, during both pregnancy and the first year of the baby's life. Over time, the um, initiative also evolved into promoting information and using um, the messages to link moms via an app. So this is you know, some of the basic examples that we have, um, or that we had in that initiative, excuse me. 44% of our Spanish-speaking participants lived in communities that were 25% or more in poverty. Um, poverty, excuse me. 35% um, of them said that they were uninsured, um, or 40, and 41% of them said that they had Medicaid or CHIP. So we were really reaching um, through Texture Baby individuals that were in communities that were disadvantaged or really needed access to services. And as a result of the messages, the data that was collected was that 52% of texture baby Spanish language respondents said that they asked a doctor or midwife about a topic. So there was a generate or a conversation starter for individuals. And then several of them reported that they, 25% of them, that they actually called the phone number. 
So this is a great way for us to connect to moms and families around the country. One of the things that the service did, um, and this was definitely be way before in the early stages, and I would advise many of you to think about this as you're dealing with either external or internal challenges, as well as institutional barriers, is to really step out of the community, have conversations, go to the markets, go to churches and have conversations with those individuals who are working for the community and with the community to have them sort of be your advisory board, if you will. They are individuals who can, one, approach your organizational leadership as well as help you serve as a broker to engage the community. And you may have to do things outside of the box. So rather than inviting the community to come to your health department or your offices, because that's just what we do, you may have to create programs in support with these advocates and these brokers that really meet the community where they are. And that you start establishing connections with them and that they also come, as I mentioned, to your leadership offices and talk with the powers to be to engage them in a more robust conversation as to how can you support the community better. Another initiative that I, or organization that I wanted to share with you um, that's been very successful in reaching the Hispanic community, the Latino community, is um, Colaborando Juntos. And I'm gonna show you that in the next slide. So CJ started as an innovative network of individuals. So they were very much individuals like you and I who saw a need for leveraging resources and connecting individuals who were doing things in the community but actually had no way of coming together to share ideas and to share information about what was working, what wasn't working, how do we not reinvent the wheel. And so this organization has over time done several annual conferences in a very tiny community in um, the middle of the Commonwealth of Virginia or the capital in the Richmond metropolitan area. Um, and this is all volunteer driven. They do a range of community events where they really bring about not the community, but the providers. So individuals like yourself and I, who we may have different challenges, whether we work with individuals with disabilities or moms or moms to be, and we think about screening or we think about, you know, how, what, how do we change the culture as individuals are coming through the door in education, et cetera. So much that the organization has evolved in the with the community, and because there are now so many organizations that support the original tenants that were created under the mission of CJ, CJ is currently now evolved into something more of a fiscal agent of sorts, as a fiscal responsible agent in fact, and community partner to organizations that are much smaller who are doing things in community-based efforts. So definitely think about you know, the little ant efforts that, you know, one ant can't do it alone, but if you're able to connect around communities and other partners and stakeholders who may be having the very similar issue like you're facing, over time you will be able to build a very strong network, but you do have to step out and connect to folks. So we're gonna go into the next section. And Amelia, could I ask you to launch um, the next uh, poll? I believe there's one more. I think that was the last poll, actually. Oh, okay. Um, so we're gonna go to the next section. So we're gonna talk really quickly about how I've mentioned a couple of things that I would suggest. Um, definitely think about the systems and policies. For example, last week, there was a conversation that I had with um, leaders from a health department. And they were saying, you know, the Latino community, we have all these barriers, we don't know how to engage them. But in the audit that was done of the health department, several other stakeholders mentioned, you know, you have a very um, big issue and it's not just the fact that Latinos are not coming to you, they're not coming to you because of the following reasons. It starts when individuals greeted at the door. It starts with the information that you share and the fact that you, you know, say we don't have an individual who would speak Spanish, but yet you haven't recruited anyone from the community. So really think about what are the systems and policies that are in place? As I mentioned in earlier, it's important that you engage cultural subject matter experts and brokers. So just because you have someone on staff who speaks Spanish, someone who you say, oh, that individual, I know her mom is Puerto Rican, or I know that her dad is Colombian, I am going to get her to be our frontline staff. And that individual may not speak Spanish. That individual may speak Spanish to a level that actually may be 
hurtful to what you're trying to achieve because they don't know how to cater to the nuances. They might be too young or they might be have different expectations as to the current community that you're working with. Definitely reach out to individuals who are subject matter experts, meaning that they are the trust, um, they have the trust. Those are the folks that you should engage. And I know that it's hard for us to think about this term that I like to use a lot, which is transcreate. Um, so here's a perfect example. This is a Starbucks sign, and I'm not sure if it was on a corporate level or a local franchise, but they translated accent only to exito aquí. That's a literal Google translation, in, or maybe someone tried to do it in-house, but exito means success. So yes, I feel like I'm very successful after I have my cup of joe in the morning. However, it's not sufficient, right, for what you're trying to convey, which is that this is where you exit, not where success happens. Um, so try to think about not doing a, not using Google. I understand that many of you have um, don't have the resources to be able to hire an interpreter or have a translator who can do everything for you. But you do have those individuals in the community who will be more than willing to look at a document and give you perhaps, oh, this is not correct. This is not the way this should be translated and give you insight. And then the last piece that I would recommend that you do is to consider all audiences. As I mentioned, your community may be in the state of Tennessee and you may be looking at a migrant community who is very well connected within the Head Start world. And so they have some, several expectations where if you are in the state of Washington, it's very different because you already have a very depthly connected community and the expectations and the needs that they have are very, very different and they are not migrants. So it's very interesting for you to look at that and consider who is it that's coming to your door. There's another thing that we also have within the Spanish speaking community that I did not talk, but I'll mention really quickly, um, is that you do have a lot of times individuals who come from uh, areas in Mexico, as well as other um, Central American countries, um, as well as South American countries whose main language is not Spanish, but an indigenous dialect. So now not you no longer have to just translate from Spanish to English and back and forth, but you now need to have someone who can help you relate the cultural nuances as well as the message. And I've seen that happen where we've had to work with interpreters to translate between English to Spanish and then Spanish to the indigenous dialect and to understand the nuances that, you know, the male plays in terms of the communication and decision-making progress. So think about all your audiences, make sure that you go out there and actually connect with folks to understand what it is that makes sense for your efforts. And last but not least, because I was aware that individuals were gonna have issues around language and around some of the components that were mentioned originally in our last um, component is that I created or I included here a link, links to several resources that I think will put you in the right start if you have questions uh, around language and how to create profiles or even how to think about creating materials when you don't have anyone on site. There are different organizations, as I mentioned here, including the Office of Minority Health of the Department of Health and Human Services who can guide you and provide more context. And of course, we can also be a resource for technical assistance, uh, as mentioned earlier by Anilia. And with that, I'll turn it back to um, our, our organizers. Thank you, and obviously we'll be here for questions. Thank you so much, Louisa. There's a lot of great resources that you shared, and um, as I mentioned at the, the top of this presentation, we will have this available, uh, the recording available on our YouTube channel and our resource center if people want to go back and refer to those links that Louisa shared at a later point in time. So now I'm going to speak about the importance of engaging Spanish-speaking families in newborn screening specifically, um, and kind of the impetus of Baby's First Test programmatic work of focusing on this target audience. So why talk about newborn screening? Well, unlike some public health services that may be disproportionately or exclusively used in certain areas or by certain populations, Newborn screening is universal in the United States, meaning that all babies have the opportunity to be screened um, across different states and territories. 
And this is sometimes conceptualized as an equalizing force that affords every baby the healthiest start possible, regardless of where they live or the uh, socioeconomic status of the family. And Louisa had some great stats that she shared earlier. Um, and so even though we do see that the Hispanic population has leveled off, um, Latinos are still the fastest growing segment of the child population if we focus on that kind of subgroup specifically. And in light of what Louisa talked about, I do want to um, say as a footnote that in my portion of the presentation, I will be using Latino and Hispanic interchangeably um, following kind of the model of the census and some other um, data sources, but um, definitely important to keep in mind the nuance that Louisa discussed earlier. Um, so the graph up there on the right shows past and projected future distributions of race and ethnicity in the U.S. child population. And if you look at that teal segment, that second from the top in the different bars, um, and then look at 2015, which is about where we are, give or take a few years, the proportion of Latino children is 25%, um, but estimated to rise to 32% by 2050. And so what we know from this is that with more Latino uh, couples starting families, they'll come into contact with many public health and healthcare systems every year, which will produce an increase in the need for health information related to newborns and newborn screening. And so it'll be important for us on the educational side to stay informed of and understand the unique considerations for educating and engaging Latino families in newborn screening. Um, and because this month is National Minority Health Month, I want to be sure that we're applying the lens of health equity to frame why we're talking about reaching Spanish-speaking families in the context of newborn screening. So many of you are probably familiar with some version of this determinants of health model that's up on the screen, which shows that factors that we may think of as being very influential to health, like clinical care and genes and biology, really only account for about 10% um, each of health at a population level whereas social and economic factors make up a much greater pr proportion at 40%. So what factors comprise that red 40% slice? Well, this list is just a sampling of some potential barriers to health that come into play and give rise to what we refer to as health disparities. So we see this in looking at different kinds of statistics. Um, one example is that twice as many Hispanic children as non-Hispanic white children were uninsured in 2014, so 10% versus 5%, um, that uninsured rate. Or the fact that 63% of Hispanic children still lack access to high quality care through a medical home versus 34% of their non-Hispanic peers. And other factors like access to transportation, as Louisa mentioned earlier, fears about immigration raids or undocumented status can inhibit families from seeking healthcare services or returning to seek care. And many of these factors can intersect um, to adversely impact health in a way that disproportionately affects Latino communities. And although the newborn screen is one point in time, its effects really can be far reaching and lifelong, as many of you know. And we need to remember that just because services are available does not mean they're accessible, and that newborn screening, while universal in the sense that every baby gets screened, doesn't necessarily entail equitable and universal follow-up services, which could include testing, diagnosis, management, monitoring, and treatment if a child is found to have a disorder through newborn screening. And families who are affected by newborn screening conditions have to navigate the complexities of the healthcare system, and these difficulties can be con uh, compounded by the social determinants of health that we saw in the previous slide. And if you're interested in a deeper dive on health equity and newborn screening specifically, I definitely encourage you to watch the recording of the webinar we hosted last week, which is available in our resource center. So now I'm going to shift focus to talk more about the work that Babies First Test has done to understand how we can better reach and empower Spanish-speaking families with newborn screening information. So in 2015, we launched Spanish.BabiesFirstTest.org, um, which is our Spanish site. This was created with the help of a contracted health translator service and was designed to mirror our English site in form and functionality. So though this is what the homepage looks like now, if you go to it today, we are in the process of updating our site to make sure that it's not just translated, but really adapted to harmonize the needs of our target audience. And this is an ongoing and iterative process, and I will speak a little more about what's informing those changes in a few slides. And just like with the English site, we wanted to get a better picture of who was visiting the Spanish site. So in December of last year, we launched a one question multiple choice survey that pops up when visitors access the Spanish site for the first time. And the graph you see here shows the breakdown of self-reported roles 
Um, notably, that almost 61% of visitors are parents or family members, and about a third are health professionals. So if you'll remember from the pie chart that I showed earlier for the English site, we see a much higher percentage of family members relative to other roles on the Spanish site versus the English site, which is interesting. Since 2015, we've made many strides in expanding um, not only the range of resources that we offer in Spanish, but also the ways that we're promoting what we offer. And this is an overview timeline of some major activities related to Baby's First Test Spanish engagement work over the last three years. These have included poster presentations at the Association of Public Health Laboratories, Newborn Screening and Genetic Testing Symposium, and the National Hispanic Medical Association Conference. We have also participated at national meetings that foster dialogue on issues in Latino health, including uh, the National Council of La Raza, which is now called UNIDOS uh, US, and the Family Voices Family Leadership Conference. And those items in red up there, I will elaborate on in a few slides, as those have really been cornerstones of our work thus far. Currently, we have Spanish language versions of all our printed newborn screening resources, which are housed on the Baby's First Test Resource Center. And this might be of particular interest to those of you on the line based on um, the last polling question we ran. So to date, we've distributed about 1,100 of our printed resources in Spanish to public health and healthcare professionals, including newborn screening follow-up staff, nurses, medical case managers, and social workers, and others that interact with Spanish-speaking individuals and families. And we see this really demonstrating a need that cuts across both care settings and timeframes. And all of these resources are free and available for order um, online. We've also explored ways of engaging online with Spanish-speaking communities. These include weekly posts in Spanish on different social media platforms, including Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, using Wellness Wednesday hashtag. Um, we also did Spanish Saturday for a while. So testing out different trending hashtags to try and broaden our reach in disseminating content. We've also created and shared Spanish language graphics about newborn screening, such as the one you see on the right. With the help of March of Dimes, um, or in collaboration with March of Dimes, we've co-hosted several bilingual Twitter chats for Newborn Screening Awareness Month in September. And we've participated in both English and Spanish in wide-reaching Twitter chats alongside many other organizations um, that are oriented toward Hispanic consumers um, and have a health focus. And before I continue, I do think it's important to recenter this discussion on the value of partnerships, especially um, keeping in mind the theme of National Minority Health Month, which is partnering for health equity. And I want to make sure we address how our partners have truly enabled and enhanced our work. So the next two activities I'll speak about, I think really exemplify working with groups that have deep roots and trusted reputations in the Hispanic communities around us. And Babies First Test really wants to maintain partnership building as a focal point of our work because we recognize that those interactions and relationships really do open up doors to many more opportunities for us. I pulled in this quote from the recent Partner for Health Equity Twitter chat that was hosted by Office of Minority Health last week because I think it really nicely encapsulates why partnership is not only beneficial, but truly indispensable in tackling health disparities, which is um, partnership is, sorry, I lost it for a second. Partnership is important because both the roots and the effects of health disparities are so deep and far reaching that no one agency or program can address them all alone. So the first thing I'm gonna talk about is our community leaders meeting. So in April 2017, Baby's First Test hosted a meeting in our offices where we convened senior management and staff from health and advocacy organizations in the Washington, D.C. area. So those were Mary Center, which is a community health center, La Clinica del Pueblo, which is a federally qualified health center, and Family Voices, which is a nationwide network of family-led advocacy groups. And we had the opportunity to speak with participants um, who are on the ground really guiding community-driven community-driven efforts within healthcare and who possess a depth of understanding about what Latino families they work with need. So up here, um, I kind of summarized the takeaways from this meeting. I'll just go over those quickly, um, what we were able to glean from discussing for a few hours with participants in the meeting. So first we talked about how to leverage um, social media networks to reach Latino consumers. Um, Louisa mentioned earlier the Pew Resource Center. Um, they have produced data that really supports the idea that a large number of Latinos are seeking health information online. 
So um, from our end, we need to think about how to find them where they are already in online spaces. We also discussed relying on leadership at the local level for guidance on how to best integrate newborn screening education into existing frameworks at clinics, for example. So we talked about you know, maybe developing curriculum for a prenatal class or putting content in an interactive module on a patient portal. Those were some ideas that came up. We also talked about engaging different family and community members in education, so not just focusing on mom as a target, but dad, grandparents, extended family, and broadening to the community to think about faith leaders, um, community health workers, others who are um, really integral to the community. And finally, um, bringing it back to partnership, we discussed partnering with organizations who have established networks and historic knowledge and experience working in Hispanic communities um, and recognizing how crucial those are um, in whatever work we do. And if you're interested in reading a fuller synopsis of the ideas that were generated at the meeting, we did produce a, uh, excuse me, a brief that summarizes the takeaways and um, that's available on the Baby's First Test Resource Center at the URL below. Next, we conducted two um, focus groups in Spanish in August of last year at La Clinica del Pueblo. As I mentioned before, this is a federally qualified health center serving primarily Latino and Spanish-speaking patients in Washington, D.C. The first focus group we held was with nine Latina mothers who predominantly or exclusively spoke Spanish and were patients at the women's clinic at La Clinica. And for us, this is really our first foray into face-to-face -face engagement with Spanish-speaking families and in meeting families where they are in a trusted space. In this case, it was a local health center where they were already receiving health services. Um, secondly, we did a, a health educator focus group, which consisted of various staff in different patient-facing roles at the clinic, including a nurse, care coordinators, billing specialist, and others. In both focus groups, we had participants look at different sections of the Spanish website and provide suggestions for what they would change or add they were also able to articulate what resonated with them, what appealed, what didn't, and so on. We posed broader questions about what sources they used to find or recommend health-related information, both online and in person, and what newborn screening resources they would find useful for themselves or others in their communities. And after the structured conversation, we got to sit down with them in a more laid-back setting and chat over a meal. So these are recommendations that we got from the focus groups, and we hope that you're able to take some of these suggestions back um, with you kind of in your own work at your own organizations. So first, um, we kind of talked about the, the visual layout of the site, um, how to be thoughtful and inclusive in selecting images, including images of fathers um, as a target audience, so more men and dads in the photos. Consider um, audio, video, video and non-text dependent formats for presenting information. So how can you present information that um, you know, can be listened to or watched instead of just read? Mobile sharing capabilities, so how people can share information easily between phones that may or may not be smartphones. Active promotion via social media and printed brochures. The moms in our focus group were very adamant about their use of brochures. They said they like to have something physical to refer to um, in hand. And they really encourage us to think out of the box about where we distribute materials. So not just thinking about kind of in the clinic or waiting room, but going out into the community, as Louisa talked about earlier, going to where people are at health fairs, baby expos, WIC sites, and so on. And from the educators, um, a lot of their feedback echoed what the family said. They talked about using graphics for visual appeal um, and utility in conveying information, simplifying content, using those plain language principles to kind of guide um, how we structure our content. They mentioned creating a short tutorial that could show people how to navigate the site, different audiences, how to find you know, the information that's most pertinent to them. They talked about working with clinics to integrate content in prenatal classes, again, um, and they said they would really want to be kept up to speed um, via short webinars that have uh, continuing education units and email blasts with the most kind of timely and relevant information. And the quote at the bottom is just one that I pulled from our family focus group who, even though they hadn't heard about newborn screening before, they recognized it as a great resource to share with friends and family. So finally, um, I'm going to just touch on where we're going in the future now that we've kind of taken stock of where we are at the moment. 
um, and tell you kind of what you can expect from baby's first test. So there's several activities in the pipeline for the Spanish website. We currently have an animated video in English about what to expect from your baby's first test, uh, but we plan to release a Spanish version of that within the next few months. We're always looking to collect and share Spanish language family stories and build out a family experience section on the Spanish website where those, you know, 61% of families who are visiting can see themselves and their stories um, reflected in the site. We recently went live with new designs for content pages on the English site, and we plan to similarly optimize the page layout on the Spanish site while ensuring that any changes we make fall in line with what we heard from the focus groups about what they thought worked and what didn't on the website. <clears throat> Excuse me. Circling back to partnership building, I want to stress this again. Um, that even if we build the best website and the best resources we can, people have to know that we're here. Um, that's really <laughs> critical for engagement. And so this is where we're going to rely heavily on partners, especially those on the ground, to promote our site and materials to improve newborn screening awareness and direct families to us if they have questions or want more information. And it also serves to provide a feedback loop to help ensure that we at Babies First Test are keeping community needs at the center of our work. And finally, we will outline a programmatic approach for engaging Spanish-speaking families to propel this work forward, not just into the next few months, but beyond. And in doing so, we want to think about sustainability factors and what it would really take to build out a full program for Spanish engagement and newborn screening. So some of the directions that we could take with this um, would include targeted content to promotores de salud, community health workers, in-service training at health centers, webinars for health professionals, um, doing a needs assessment with health professionals who are in the role of discussing newborn screening results and performing follow-up services. Conducting a needs assessment with state newborn screening programs and thinking strategically about how we as the clearinghouse can support those needs. And doing additional focus groups with new and expecting parents, family members, physicians, nurses, promotores, care coordinators, and other stakeholders. So finally, I want to end by sharing a quote from a newborn screening follow-up coordinator who wrote to us about our Spanish disease-specific information on the Spanish website. Um, so she said, thank you for being ahead of the game and providing that resource as translating materials is often lower on the list, but we all know that newborn screening doesn't distinguish whether a family is English speaking or not. And so I thought this was a nice quote to, uh, to close on. Um, because this idea of newborn screening doesn't distinguish really does echo what we heard in the community meeting and focus groups. As truly at the end of the day, families, whether they're English or Spanish speaking, Latino or not, are not really so different in terms of you know, what they want. They want to do all they can to secure the healthiest future for their children. And much of the information that they seek is the same, but what may look different are the ways in which we as educators convey that information so that it's most effective in reaching them. So with that, um, we will open it up for questions in the last few minutes here. Um, so as I mentioned before, if anyone on the line um, has questions, feel free to type those into the chat box um, and Louisa or I can uh, address those. So we can start with um, a question on our end. So Louisa, um, how can we address the fears around identification and potential retribution for families who are undocumented but need newborn screening follow-up testing? Do you have any ideas kind of based on the data that you pulled or things that you've seen? So that's a very tricky one given that um, things are ever so changing in our uh, current environment. And so I think, you know, the most, um, I'm sorry, there's a little echo, but I hope you guys can hear me okay. One of the things that I think it's important is for you, as I mentioned, to be very authentic about why this is important in when you engage moms um, and for, you know, to be able to share why it's important if a, a test does come back, that needs, there needs to be follow-up screening, et cetera. Um, that you are able to then contact the family. But it is going to be um, something that you will continue to deal with. And I think the best thing that you can do is to, if you're able to, and have individuals who have gone through um, newborn screening and may perhaps 
they remember that they, oh yeah, my daughter was identified as, you know, maybe having some issues with their hearing and we had to go through tests. Maybe have the mom's story collected, whether it's like a little video that you can have or audio of her voice telling the story that you can somehow share um, in a pamphlet, in a recording, something of some sort to give folks that comfort and to really um, focus on why it's so important but it all comes down to the experience that the family receives, the understanding of, you know, why is this something that's important? And then for you to work around the ambassadors, the brokers, the individuals who are working with you in the community to really figure out how can we address this? How can we relay this? And for you to understand that this is not going to be an issue specific to newborn screening. This is an issue that's affecting every type of program and outreach and engagement in the community. So it, it is an opportunity, as I mentioned early, for all of us to work in tandem and figure out a creative approach that works in our respective communities. So I'm sorry that I can't be as clear as you may perhaps would want and provide better guidance, but it is a very community-centric approach that has to be taken. Yeah, I think that's, that's great, Louisa. Um, so we did have another question come in. So someone said, regarding the Spanish site, have you considered using a URL that reflects a Spanish translation of baby's first test, the word Espanol, or www.babiesfirsttest.com slash Espanol, for example? So uh, at the moment, our URL is um, just spanish.babiesfirsttest.org. I, I definitely appreciate having a URL that's more reflective of the Spanish translation um, to kind of make it more intuitive for Spanish speaking visitors. Um, we haven't considered that at the moment, but it's certainly something we could keep in mind. Um, I will note that if you navigate to the English homepage, um, there is a little tab in the upper right corner that does say Espanol. So if someone comes to the English site um, and is looking for something in their language, um, that's kind of an easy way to direct them over to the, the Spanish language site. All right, let's see. Um, another question is, what's a good first step for moving beyond just translation as a Spanish-speaking family engagement strategy? So, um, I mean, Louisa, you're welcome to address this as well, but I think from our end, um, really our, our efforts to get out into the community and interact and, and dialogue with people who we want to be reaching with those, um, you know, moms who, and I didn't mention this specifically, but in the family focus group we hosted, we had moms who had newborns and moms who had 12 year olds. So really um, mothers who've been <laughs> kind of in it for a long time or are recent moms. And so we got kind of a range of perspectives there. Um, so getting to talk to them about, you know, how can we make this site um, better fitted for you and what, would you want to see um, as an uh, expecting or new parent visiting? Um, I think getting those insights is really a great first step for not just translating. Um, and Louisa mentioned the example of using Google Translate and where sometimes those um, kind of mistranslations or um, other snafus can happen. Um, I think really, as we've talked about, everything has to be community centric and Again, meeting people where they are um, to understand what their needs are. Um, we are at the top of the hour, but Louisa, did you have anything to add on to that? Um, what I would say, and like I said, this is uh, something that I would encourage. There are individuals in the community who are have a very high level of English slash Spanish fluency who could probably be support in the support mode for you. So not necessarily someone that you would have to pay, by someone that can help you and guide the process as to what's more important, how can we do this? Are there existing networks or students or individuals who can help us craft something that we can vet as a group of stakeholders and have a finished product that would resonate with our audience? Um, so I would say definitely give that a, uh, a test drive and you know use, use your networks and think about what can we come up with and really looking at the big picture of what is it that we're trying to achieve and prevent and how can we really work around this one issue of making sure that moms understand the importance of screening, understand the importance of follow-up and how our resources can 
what kind of resources can we create to make sure that we drive that message um, and encourage participation? Great. So we are out of time, but there was one more question that came in that I wanted to address. So um, we have, what programs do you have in Portland or Corpus Christi, Texas? So Baby's First Test is, you know, operates at a national level. So we do work closely with all the state newborn screening programs, um, but in terms of specific projects or programs or initiatives that are within states or particular regions, um, I definitely encourage you to reach out to um, the people on the ground. So if you're looking at Portland, Oregon, or Corpus Christi, Texas, you can find contact information um, for those public health departments on the Babies First Test website. Um, or if you reach out to us directly, we can put you in touch with the right people if you want more information. And with that, um, I want to thank everyone for joining and, and special thanks to Louisa for being here to chat with us and really share um, all the, the insights that you've gained um, through the years of working in this field. And um, we value everyone's participation and this will be available um, for viewing later in just a few days. And please, 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 please don't hesitate to reach out to anyone on the Baby's First Test team um, if you have other questions or ideas. And you can visit us uh, online at the URLs on the screen there. And thank you so much, everyone, and have a great rest of your day.